In my book, Free, Fair, and Alive, written with my colleague Silke Helfridge, I wanted to understand the deeper logic and dynamics of commons. Fortunately, we were able to stand on the shoulders of Professor Eleanor Ostrom and her pioneering work. She had identified eight basic design principles of commons, an achievement that earned her the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2009. Ostrom pointed out that successful commons, for example, have clearly defined boundaries and rules that are adapted to their local circumstances. People affected by the rules must be able to participate in making those rules, monitoring how they're implemented, and enforcing them. A commons has to have its own low-cost, rapid systems for dealing with conflict, and it has to have independence from government. Ostrom's focus on cooperation within groups and how cooperation constitutes its own form of economy was groundbreaking stuff. Relationships matter. This is an idea that most economists have dismissed or pushed to the margins. And yet, for all of her pioneering work in explaining commons, Ostrom was largely working within the standard economic framework, which focuses on managing resources and uh, the idea that we're rational actors who are trying to grab as much as we can for ourselves. Ostrom didn't have much to say about the inner lives of commoners either or about the political economy. From my own experiences in studying the commons verse, I came to see that our non-rational natures, our emotions, our collective identities, our cultural values, play essential roles in making a commons work. My co-author Silke Helfrich and I quickly learned that there can be no universal set of principles for all commons because every commons is unique, the, the product of its own special history and circumstances and geography and culture and leaders and so forth. So here was the problem we faced. How can one make generalization, generalizations among commons that differ so radically? Think how open source software communities are very different from community land trusts and how the stewardship of rivers differs so much from mutual aid networks. We found answers in the works of uh, Christopher Alexander, a dissident urban planner and architect who developed the idea of pattern languages. This is the idea that across history and cultures, certain solutions keep cropping up as ways to solve recurrent problems. Social patterns emerge. These patterns arise from social practice from the bottom up, and the best, more effective ones show their value as more and more people embrace them. We see this in the way Creative Commons licenses let us legally share copyrighted works, for example, and how indigenous peoples in Latin America uh, try to live the cultural ethic of buen vivir, good living. We see the patterns of relationships that farmers have when they practice agroecology and permaculture. We see patterns of peer governance in platform cooperatives. Patterns of commoning are satisfying, effective ways of solving collective action challenges. The patterns aren't a single set of best practices or a blueprint of fixed universal principles, Rather, they're social behaviors that are adapted to the particular resource and circumstances and history of that commons. Most importantly, these patterns are constantly evolving and changing. They're alive. Silk and I found several dozen patterns of commoning and grouped them in three distinct spheres, social life, peer governance, and provisioning. These can be roughly classified as the social, the institutional, and the economic. Together, these three spheres constitute what we call the triad of commoning. The point of this approach is to make visible the rich dynamics of commoning as relational. Commons are living social systems. The patterns help us see commons as intersubjective social realities, meaning it's all about our emotions and attitudes, our group behaviors, our relationships with the earth. Instead of talking about resources, we need to talk more about care wealth, which is a different category of value. Care wealth is something that has social meaning, something we care about and respect, which is something that market prices and transactions are just incapable of doing. Instead of talking about economic rationality as if it's rational to be a selfish individual taking everything for ourselves and destroying the earth, we need to talk about Ubuntu rationality 
This is the idea that we need to align our collective interests with our individual needs, or as the Bantu of South Africa put it, using the word Ubuntu, I am because we are. Instead of talking about private property as if the decisions of corporations were confined to some private sphere, and that someone ought to have such massive power over essential infrastructures, we need to talk about relationalized property. This term helps emphasize the very idea that property is entangled in countless relationships and responsibilities and in, in our identities and traditions and customary practices. I think you can get the idea behind these new concepts and words. To become a commoner means that we have to shed some of the old vocabularies and worldviews, most notably the ones upheld by standard economics and Western law. Let's review some key elements of the triad of commony, the three spheres. Social life. The first imperative of any commons is to establish a relational living system in which everything is co-created. The social life of a commons matters a great deal. One important pattern here is cultivate shared purpose and values. Without this practice, a commons falls apart. People need to share experiences and reflect on their shared practices if they're going to become a robust commons. A related pattern for the social life of a commons is ritualized togetherness. People have to meet with each other, share each other's lives, or celebrate their togetherness as a group. It's important to play together and organize rituals and festivities. The social life of a commons requires that people freely contribute another important pattern. People have to give without the expectation that they'll directly or immediately get an equivalent value back. That will come in time. There's also a need for gentle reciprocity, social exchange that doesn't necessarily provide uh, benefits uh, that are absolutely equal, but more of a loose, informal sense of fairness. In a commons, this kind of indirect reciprocity is how social bonds get created. It's not the direct, even Stephen, exchange of markets. But peer governance is another sphere of commoning. Peer governance is all about seeing others as equals. Everyone shares the rights and duties of collective decision-making. They work together to create and enforce rules and set boundaries on the commons and so on. When you have peer governance, you try to avoid hierarchies of centralized systems of power because they can be a setup for the abuse of power and accountability problems. Peer governance requires, among other things, sharing knowledge generously, another pattern. This is a crucial way to generate collective wisdom. Knowledge grows when it's shared, but this can only happen if information is accessible and freely circulated. Related to this pattern is honor transparency in a sphere of trust. Transparency can't be mandated. It won't happen unless people trust each other enough to share difficult, embarrassing, and crucial information. There are too many other patterns of peer governance to explain here, but let me mention a very important one, keeping commony and commerce distinct. If a commons gives too much priority to money and sees itself as a market player, the spirit of cooperation and generous participation will erode. So, to prevent commerce from corrupting social trust in the commons, people need to create buffers or intermediaries with markets, ways to neutralize the whole transactional mindset and the appetite for money-making. Finally, the third and final sphere of commoning, provisioning. This is the idea that commoners themselves produce what they need. There's no separation of production and consumption as in the market economy. Commoners are not producing to sell to consumers, they're producing for themselves and their allies. This helps them avoid the manipulations, the eco-destruction, the trickery that markets are notorious for. A basic goal of provisioning in a commons is to reintegrate one's economic needs with the rest of one's life and with the earth. Commoners aren't interested in producing a maximum uh, amount of stuff as a way to boost investment returns. They're not into rip-and-run exploitation of nature. They're about enhancing their personal well-being over the long term and regenerating ecosystems. A basic pattern of provisioning is make and use together. 
Anyone who wants to participate and take responsibility can join. Everyone contributes according to their own capacities, talents, and needs. Co-producing is the core process of what we might call DIT, do it together. Another important pattern is support care in decommodified work. You honor authentic care work and avoid the obsessive productivity of markets. Another pattern is share the risks of provisioning. Commoners pool their energies and money to minimize their collective risks. Much as a, a community-supported agriculture farm uses everyone's contributions to spread the risks of a drought and share the benefits of a great harvest. In my book, Free, Fair, and Alive, Silk and I identified about two dozen patterns of commoning that are needed to coordinate cooperation. But as commons grow and spawn a rich ecosystem of players, a new set of complications arise. How to scale the commons? How can each individual commons connect and coordinate with others in mutually supportive ways? First, we need to realize that scaling the commons, building the commons verse, is not about building some centralized hierarchical organization or movement. It's about building a new system of distributed power. It's about the process of what we say it call emulate and federate, in which people develop new horizontal connections among each other and among commons, leveraging the spirit of cooperation at the macro scale. I'll talk about that in the next video on making the Anto shift.